off full first because I want to speak two or three hours. <laughs> and I'm not done, I just quit and go home. All I want to do is count, and when one half's gone, I quit. <laughs> but I do. Uh, I'll preach in a few minutes. Really well. I'm going to speak on Jesus under fire. And we'll read the passage of scripture that was given to me, but I want to encourage you as a group, we've got to recover the gospel according to Romans. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, right. And I'm not assuming that a 30-minute tirade tonight is that mm -hmm. they take all year just to introduce you with the content of Romans 7. I want to talk about that and affirm that. That must be recovered. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'll say that uh, a little later on. But as a matter of fact, Romans have transformed the church five times. People heard the content, so we're talking about what it was so powerful. It wasn't just a meeting that you want the man to come back next year and, and put people to sleep again, and then the singing would come and tirade and sing songs that nobody wants to hear. But a revival transforms society, transforms lives, families, jobs. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, if I don't get to that point, then I, that's really what I want to say to you. And I'm not selling books. I, uh, I'm not in the book business or stealing business. Or I have 100,000 books in my library, but you may not have any of them. I want to call your attention to several books about Christ. And as a matter of fact, I uh, appreciate Charles' affirmation, but almost no one, and what I'll say tonight too, almost no one, even in the church, believes the word of it. Well, I'm on a engage that group a little bit tonight. Uh, we can affirm what's clearly in the Bible. That doesn't mean that even most church members believe it or even know what it says. Yes. So I want to encourage you, your special anybody to come out when it's hundred degrees outside and hundred and four inside. <laughs> and I'm looking for heat stroke any minute. Uh, those of you that know and none of you care, but uh, four years ago I had eight hours of surgery. And, and before I was out in three weeks, I had 32 blue coats. Do you know what that is? That's a horizontal brain scan, 32 times. Some people still think that that's true today. But that's <laughs> I, I want to mention to you some books. I'm not selling books. If you're not interested, I'm not interested. I'm interested. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I don't think you can market people. Make a church and don't make a church. Amen. You can't pick him up to make him seek a friend. Amen. Amen. All who stand in his way. Amen. Amen. And he doesn't seek to be the chairman of the board. The <laughs> ORID. <laughs> now, as a matter of fact, these issues are not brand new issues that I want to talk to you tonight. But the issue is that it's a resurgent issue. That is important. Why at this time? The fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. A billion and a quarter Muslims. Almost all war fronts in our world are religious war fronts. They're not political and they're not economic. Even though people are starving to death and they get to it right away. But it's over religious commitment. The fastest growing religion in America is New Age pantheism. And that shows up in media. Shows up in science fiction that the kids just can't wait to get home and see again. Mm -hmm. And it shows up in all the structure of our education, yeah. free school on. Now comes space education is new age pantheon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So by the time they come to church, I tell people, don't send that pathological church to the kid to me and think in 30 minutes I'm going to pick him up. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> because I'm not God. <laughs> I'm not even a magician. <laughs> So we're going to talk about some influences, and that can't be done in 30 minutes. I, I say, I want you to know that I know that that can't be done. And uh, we're going to have some overhead projection because that's mega trend. That's, that's <laughs> every church that doesn't have $100,000 worth of electronic equipment is going down in two. <laughs> and the preacher isn't funny and quick and uh, filled with stories and mentions the Bible once and maybe Jesus on the way out. In 12 minutes, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm not coming back. I'm out of here. Just quick as I can get. 
So I want to call your attention to some books. Not selling books, not of course. Yeah. This man's getting out of hand. <laughs> this is fair. When you said comic goes in. I know it's been brain damage. But I didn't do it. I call your attention to some books uh, about Jesus. Uh, Ronald Nash. He used to be a used car salesman, and now he's uh, 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 teaches in seminary. Very fine book. No, you may not keep them, and I put them in the box and took them out as soon as I'm out of here. I just wanted you to know about it. Now, the guru of evangelical scholarship, even though he's Calvinist, and I don't know whether Calvinists could be saved, but <laughs> our friend Carl Henry, uh, without any question, he's the most astute evangelical mind in the world this very hour. He's written a new book on the identity of Jesus. Doesn't matter. Why are you writing a new book? There's 10,000. I've got 1,000 of them in my library. Why are you writing a new one? Because it's a hot issue. <laughs> What's hot? That's hot. You wait it's hot to do that. And then, uh, I know I pass out among you. That's what I'm going to do next. I'm not asking about scholarship. I'm asking about information. See, don't try to palm off on me. I'm not the person to try to palm off. Don't spend a lot of time trying to talk to him to this mountain. That these issues I'm going to talk about are just for scholars. No, they're for Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for all people. Right. And Jesus is under fire in our culture. It's even in the church. Mm -hmm. Now, this, yeah. is, this is a brain dead result of mega, the big evangelical, or not, uh, big scholars in New Testament studies from the Jesus Seminar. I don't want you to know about it because it, you lose your faith and become a Buddhist paratrooper or a left wing and left wing thief or something. <laughs> but this book is a result of two years. I say it took two years to write that? Good. Thanks a lot. What word is it? But anyway, the five gospels. Now, what the essence is not new. It, it, it's so old that I just can't believe. Yeah, I am in no condition to have a cardiac arrest. I can't take anison. So I uh, watch what I listen to, and I'm about to have one, I'm coming, Elizabeth, you know that. This is a result of a big time. We're not big time. They don't even know we're here. Only God knows we're here. But the five gospels, well, now they're trying to tell me something I heard 40, 50 years ago, and those who knew heard it 100 years ago, but this ran. Compound the ancients had stolen over I did. Five gospels? Now, the essence of that is that it's color-coded. Well, that's mega trend, isn't it? My, that's um, color code. You can tell me color, but what's well, see, Jesus has almost no words from the gospel. Jesus, so, so just a, a eight percent of all that's in the gospel should no word. That's not what the Bible says, is it? No. So I ask them, even if it's true, how would you know that? <laughs> and they just sit and, and stare. I said, you, you need to go to your heart doctor and your eye doctor right away while I'm talking to you. But I ask you, you talk like you know things, and I want to know how you know them. Even if they're true, you couldn't possibly know it. I just said, sit on the walk away. This drives me crazy. That's like, <laughs> like Alice Cheshire Cat. You laugh a lot, and people are just driving crazy. They don't know whether you've done something or wish you did. <laughs> That's correct. Just go around smiling. They think you're crazy. Well, they might anyway, so. <laughs> anyway, this book, I would encourage serious people in the Bible, and that would be all of you, I suppose. <laughs> I don't really know that. Why did I say that? I have no reason to say that. And another book is Jesus Under Fire. This is an evangelical response to that book. Hmm. And there are believers that take stand that are not physically correct. I'm going to say all kinds of things aren't really correct. But I tell people, wherever I go, I've already been thrown out of their places. <laughs> and if it offends you, just wait a while. i got some more. I'm an offender. I have degrees in offense. I also have a thermometer in my garage that read you a degree, so I like to be a But anyway, if you're interested, the church ought to run that through the Sunday school. Yeah. Take all year. Don't take 30 minutes. Forget about it. That's all the time you got. But Jesus is under fire in our culture, in the church. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it's not just at the Harvard, Harvard Men's School where they have believed in anything for 150 years. 
But they have to go to school to get any content of belief system at all. And these are the people training in the ministry. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about even evangelicals and that. People that claim to believe the Bible. Well, these, I'm not selling books. Did I tell you that before? <laughs> well, that's enough, because Bob uh, wants to take me home. My dear friend, uh, Dr. Bob Kirka, uh, Jewel doesn't authorize me to be out punished. Uh, and he graciously uh, brought me down here. And if he doesn't get me home, she will be on this case. <laughs> now, not because she wants to see me, but just because he's messed up. <laughs> and then all of you people I've seen him, but the Kyle Gardner, Kyle was a precious friend of mine. And hundreds of years ago, um, we were in school together. And I thank God for Kyle. Did I tell you I couldn't stay? I'll be gone in a minute. So then, yeah. <laughs> just shut the lights up and go home. People think you've been somewhere. <laughs> All right, we're going to have some overhead projectors, but because of the limitation, I'm taking the time out of the next speaker's time, is what I'm going to do. And he'll speak till midnight, just like Paul, you know, he spoke till midnight and it fell out of a window. But these are pretty crummy windows. I don't know what kind of windows you have here. You couldn't fall out of them. You couldn't even get in them. Who would do that? I want to see the committee that authorized putting those windows in this place. This is a serious matter. It's over life and death. It's, it's salvation. Really, who would do it, such a thing as that? I don't know. But I want to know before I leave. I want to know why you did such a thing. They're, they're not on the third floor either. N no. You have to go up the ceiling or climb a tree to get on the third floor. <laughs> okay. I don't know what I'm doing with that book. That's a song book. And I've had... A request, but I'm going to sing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it don't make any difference to me. The only thing I think is terrible, but I'm, I'm going to sing. And if you don't like it, I just say it doesn't take so much to do it. If you don't like so much, it don't take very much. Would you please turn to the, so somebody can hurry up about this. Turn to the fifth chapter of Romans. And after we've read that, I want to read, uh, of course, our, our precious brother mentioned the dynamics of political correctness that dominates our whole culture, everything. And political correctness, the only thing that's politically incorrect is Christianity. Yeah, really. See, and I, just for one, uh, just pay not the slightest attention to that. Amen. See, a stupid person is educationally uh, deprived. That's not all that's wrong with everybody, deprived. And uh, uh, they've got a jargon for everything. And any time, the great moguls of language said, any time a people lose their language, they lose their mind. That's right. And they lose their soul. Mm -hmm. yeah. So our culture is losing its mind. Now, in the most advanced culture since the Greeks, since the Gre Germans, Germans were the first to the Greeks, and then we piddle along with that. Now, how could we live in an information dynamic where recorded information doubles every year and a half? And everybody's got to be computer literate. Now, I'm for computers, but you see, you have a generation that can't read nor write nor parse a sentence and nor a verb from an adjective off the of computers. So we'll pay a deadly price for technological advancement in this very generation mm -hmm. yeah. without any question at all. But okay, go ahead and do it, because you're going to do it anyway. All right. Stop that child, would you please? I want to know why that child is upset. I must have information about that child, because I'm reading the KGB, and I want information, and misinformation is our calling. See, if there's no true truth, there's also no lying. If there's no lying, then I don't know what we're talking about. I'd like to read. Now, hold down the excitement. You get out of hand, see, rather easily. Uh, James Finn Gardner, Gardner was on the top, well, top of the top ten bestsellers in America for ten weeks. I don't know what he is today because I didn't look today. But for 10 weeks, this book was the top of the top 10 sellers of books in the United States. And what it is, is a powerful critique of political correctness. I'm going to read you a story, 
And if you don't like it, I'll just go home. I don't talk because I don't tolerate uh, incompetence or comatose audiences. I just haven't got time. I got too much to do. Now, this is a politically correct. We're going to talk about the blood. I will get to that sometime tonight. Little Red Riding Hood in politically correct vocabulary. There was once a young person named Red Riding Hood who lived with her mother on the edge of a large wood. Sounds okay so far, huh? One day her mother asked her to take a basket of fresh fruit and mineral water to her grandmother's house, not because this was a woman's work, mind you, but because the deed was generous and helpful and genders a feeling of community. <laughs> Furthermore, her grandmother was not sick, but rather she was full physical and mental health and was fully capable of taking care of herself as a mature adult. So Red Riding Hood set off with her basket to the woods. It's okay so far. Many people believe that the forest was foreboding and dangerous place and never set foot in it. Red Riding Hood, however, was confident enough in her own budding asexuality that such obvious Freudian imagery did not intimidate her. On her way to Grandma's house, Red Riding Hood was accosted by a wolf who asked her what was in her basket. She replied, some helpful snacks for my grandmother who is certainly capable of taking care of herself as a mature adult. The wolf said, you know, my dear, it isn't safe for a little girl to walk through the woods alone. Red Riding Hood said, I find your sexist remarks offensive in the extreme. <laughs> but I will ignore it because of your traditional status of an outcast from society. <laughs> the stress of which has caused you to develop your own entirely valid worldview. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must be on my way. Red Riding Hood walked on along the main path, but because her status outside of society had freed her from slavish adherence to linear Western-style thought, the wolf knew a quicker route to Grandma's house. He burst into the house and ate Grandma, an entirely valid course of action for a carnivorous such as himself. Then unhampered by a rigid traditionalist notion of what was masculine or feminine, he put on Grandma's night clothes and crawled into bed. Red Riding Hood entered the cottage and said, Grandma, I brought you some fat-free sodium-free snacks. Salute you on your role as a wise, nurturing matriarch. From the bed, the wolf said, so come closer, my child, so that I might see you. Red Riding Hood said, oh, I forgot. You're optically challenged as a fat grandma. What big eyes you have. Mm -hmm. They have seen much and forgiven much, my dear. Grandma, what big nose you have. Only relatively, of course, and certainly attractive in its own way. <laughs> It has smelled much and forgiven much, my dear. Grandma, what big teeth you have. The wolf said, I'm happy with who I am and what I am, and leaped out of bed and he gra grabbed Red Riding Hood in his claws, intent on devouring Red Riding Hood. And she screamed, not out of alarm of the, world, the wolf's apparent tendency toward cross-dressing, but because of his willingful invasion of her personal space. Her screams were heard by a passing woodchopper person or a log fuel technician, <laughs> as he preferred to be called. When he burst into the cottage, he saw uh, Mel Melon there and tried to intervene. But as he raised his axe, Red Riding Hood and the wolf both stopped. And just what do you think you're doing, asked Red Riding Hood. The woodchopper person blinked and tried to answer, but no words came to him. 
bursting in here like a Neanderthal, trusting your, your weapon to do your, your thinking for you, she explained. Sexist? Speciest? How dare you assume that women and wolves can't solve their problems without man's help? When she heard Red Riding Hood's impassioned speech, Grandma jumped out of the wolf's mouth, seized the woodchopper's person's axe, and cut his head off. After this ordeal, Red Riding Hood, Grandma and the wolf felt a certain com commonality of purpose. <laughs> they decided to set up an alternative household based on mutual respect and cooperation, and they lived together in the woods happily forever. <laughs> That's what happens when you lose your mind. Uh, and it, it's only funny. You know, it, it's so sad, I would cry, but I don't have time to cry, so I laugh a lot. It drives people crazy, and some people don't have far to go. So when I drive them, I just said, how far are you going? To get the context of, of the message uh, proposed by our beloved uh, mentor this evening, turn to Romans 5. And in a few moments... Uh, Time is like, <clears throat> is relative, and not just because of Einstein's equation. Some of you want to know about solution to those equations before I leave tonight, and I'll do some of that for you, but time is relative. It, it depends on whether you're waiting, waiting on your wife or husband or sitting on a hot stove. <laughs> See, what do you mean by t -t time? Romans 5. Now, I will say more about that in a few moments, but I want to encourage you personally and in the church to recover the gospel according to Romans. God has used that, not Daniel, not Matthew, not John, not Acts, right. not Timothy, not the book of Revolution, but the Roman epistle. Five times he's turned society inside out when they heard the gospel according to Romans talk about that in a little bit if you can stay if you can't stay that's perfectly all right i understand verse one let's read now ours is not a reading society it's a visual society it's not an audibility society we can't hear but we can see because we see faster we see it's speed of light and we hear it's speed of sound some discrepancy in that therefore it's a transitional preposition to grammarians here it's a transitional preposition to non-grammarians. Therefore, something's gone before. Something follows from this. Mm -hmm. Since we have been justified through faith, underscored that. Now, that's a penal term. That is a politically incorrect term to talk about justification because it sounds like there's some penalty and some judgment, and that is not acceptable even in many evangelical churches. Yeah. We'll talk more about that later. He says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Underscore peace. We live in a pluralistic world, and there's less and less peace every day. So what is the nature of this peace? Psychological peace? Well, there's more people come un unglued in unnamed schools. Half of seminary personnel are in counseling. I mean, some belong in counseling, but they're in counseling. What do you think that means? It means thousands of people are coming unglued in the churches. Yes. Why all of a sudden? Isn't anybody whole anymore? Well, mark that, peace. That almost never in either Old or New Testament means peace more. It means inside. Amen. Verse 2, through whom we have gained access. Now notice, it's not a self-attainment. Yeah. We received it as a gift. Amen. And a gift is very costly. I'll yeah. say it again, but it's so fundamental for if I don't get to it. <coughs> See, he paid a debt that he did not owe. Amen. Because I owed a debt I could not pay. Amen. Amen. That's the heart of the blood being justified by the blood. Amen. I owe more than I can pay. Amen. And he demanded it because of his holiness, and he paid it because of his love. Amen. Amen. Through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace. Grace is not a politically correct category, and she's a blue-eyed blonde. 
in which we now stand. Amen. Not will stand now. That's like a 500 pound canary. I want a cracker now. Now. And we rejoice in hope. Amen. Many people are hopeless. They're in complete despair. Life is meaningless. Hope. We can't create our own hope. Amen. Hope is a gift. Amen. Grace is a gift. Amen. Joy is a gift. All the things that count, you can't go to school and get a degree in. Amen. They're free. Amen. Verse 3, not only so, but we also rejoice. Now, this is politically incorrect, period. We rejoice in suffering. Oh, I like to suffer. I really like that. I like suffering. Did you ever talk like that? Well, left and right hemispheres would get horizontal brain readout if you ever said that. I enjoy suffering. Oh, you do. I didn't realize that. But see, there's something about being a Christian. Jesus is under fire. He suffered and died alone. Mm -hmm. But one day I went to that tomb and it was empty. Yes. If he just died, he wouldn't solve the problem. Right. Amen. Suffering. Mark those words because sometime I have to get to it. Not tonight, but sometime. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. You want to bet? Have you been to psychiatrists recently? He said, what you need to do is suffer more. <laughs> and that'll create self-image in you little rascals. Mark all those politically incorrect terms. What's so powerful in Romans? It'll tear you inside out and turn you upside down. That's what's in it. Now, perseverance character. Well, one of the modes in politically correct education is character development. You're trying to produce character without reference to God. Amen. That can't be done. Amen. Amen. Perseverance, character, put that down. That's a hot button. If we had all, all year, we talk about theories of character formation in the school system. And character, hope. Now, no one can live very long without hope. Amen. Right. That's not possible. Whoever you are, wherever you are, without hope, it's over. So underscore all those powerful things there. Watch that child. That child's already omnipotent. And hope does not disappoint us. Amen. Oh, there's nothing, nothing that'll break you to pieces faster than being disappointed. See, until you've loved someone, you can't be brokenhearted. That's right. Amen. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, that's not, that, you don't go to the university to be powerless. Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. See, blood is a metaphor for the cross, and the cross is the, the essence of the atonement. I'll say that. So we can talk about the blood and get a pharmacological analysis of blood. I've heard dumb sermons an hour on the, the chemistry of blood. Uh, that wasn't even interesting. So don't, don't confuse blood talk with blood talk. Seven, very rarely will anyone die for the righteous. I don't know of a person. Said, oh, I'm glad to give my life for you. I, I'm crazy about you. Or you just crazy. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare. No. Nah. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, what power does death have? We don't aspire. Said, we're going home and die. He died for us. Yes, don't ever forget. We owed a debt that we couldn't pay. That's right. And he paid a debt they didn't owe. For us. Amen. Amen. 
Since we have now been justified, we need to verb analysis and parse that sentence, but you've got to go home. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved? Now we got another term. We're just loading down with powerful terms here. Saved from God's wrath. Oh, that's not politically correct. Wrath. That's negative if you've ever heard of it. Wrath. Well, sound like an angry God. He's angry at us. That's not what the Bible means by orge, wrath. It means that he's holy, and God will not tolerate rebellion against holiness. Amen. He's not angry with us. He's not angry with any person in this town. But see, the conditions of coming to him must be met. Amen. Uh, there's no universalism in the Bible. We're all saved because nobody's perfect. Well, that last statement is correct. Nobody's perfect, but we're not all saved. But I'm not a Calvinist either, so where does that leave me? See? For just a little while, Jesus under fire, just to locate the, the verse that this precious man asked me to, to come in. And Dr. Kirka, now Dr. Kirka, very bright young man, he didn't have anything to do, so he drove 450 miles down here. And we were, we were ecstatic about that until some of the brothers said they came 1,700 miles. That's a long walk, I tell you that. My goodness, 1,700 miles to be here? And most people in town aren't even here, and they just got to walk across the street? What? There has to be something wrong with that, but I don't have time to discuss that with you tonight. But if I were here very long, I'd discuss that with you. Amen. I want you to notice this, and I will get to preaching. There is such a thing as, as homiletic structure, but I want to tell you this. C.S. Lewis, some of you read, asked about, I, I used to do analysis of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, in 1929, 1932, he became a, a theist in 1929, and he was surprised by glory in 1932. He was surprised by joy when he came to Jesus. Now, that man is a great international biggie. I'm, I'm not asking if you've ever read or ever heard of C.S. Lewis. That's your problem. But C.S. Lewis has won more people to Jesus than all the preaching in the 20th century. Now, to read any of C.S. Lewis's work is better than 100,000 bad sermons and 10,000 good ones. But you don't have to read it. Now, here's what C.S. Lewis found out. Precocious, A student at Oxford and Cambridge, dummy like that. He came to Jesus, and his life was completely transformed. And he wrote to tell the people in literary form, he said this about Jesus, our Lord. He said, Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Amen. 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 And since I don't believe he was a liar, and he certainly was no lunatic, the only option that leaves, he's my Lord. Amen. Now that's odd for Cambridge Oxford Don to be announcing in public because you could lose your job for doing that. Try it at high school. <coughs> Try it, some teacher, unless you'd like to be uh, called at 5 o'clock in the morning and said, please do not come back to school. You had some offensive things. You mentioned Jesus, and you carried a Bible with you. We can't allow that. Well, hurry up, somebody. But well, would you notice this, this phenomena here? Now, I realize this is cheap, very cheap material. I'm going to get, I need $100,000 worth of electronic equipment. If anybody here has got $100,000, I don't want to borrow it. I, I need it, just outright. I need a $50,000 laser reader and a $25,000 high-speed uh, multiple, uh, you used to call Xerox machines. Now, I need that immediately. I, I've got larger lists than that, but if you know anybody that's crazy about me to give me $100,000 before I leave town, let me hear from them. Okay? Now, if you can't read this, that's your problem. You need to go to the eye doctor. Do you have any obstetricians in town here? Well, this is, this is about about blood concept in the Bible. See, blood's only mentioned two times in the Roman epistle, and one, one time in the verse that he asked me about. But that's not all it has to say about it. He's talking about the crucifixion. He's Amen. talking about the atonement. Amen. 
Well, you can say certain things without using the word. Amen. You mean blood only appears two times in Roman, and the whole Roman epistle is about the atonement? Yes. Amen. <laughs> That's correct. Amen. Well, look at that. Blood. We can go through blood in the Old Testament, the, the blood, the, the sacrificial system, but Jesus fuses two dynamic elements in the blood sacrifice in the Old Testament. He fuses them in himself, and every Jew would have known that. See, when the high priest also was the sacrifice, that would not happen in Jewish culture. That's right. That's right. And the metaphor of the lamb, well, he's not a lamb, he's a lamb. That's a metaphor of, of atonement. Well, first of all, why do I need atonement? Because I've sinned. But after Freud, sin is pathology, it's neurosis. Oh, good. So atonement's out. Incarnation's out. In a scientific world, virgins don't have babies. If some 17-year-old girl in this town said, I'm pregnant, but I'm a virgin, he said, oh, what happens all the time? Is that what you do? What do you think they would do with Mary? 17-year-old Jewish girl unmarried. One morning, she's pregnant. What happens all the time? That's wonderful. It's just lifestyle. But that's not what they said there. There's something going on that's going to transform the world. But ordinarily, we wouldn't believe it for a minute. 17 year old girl in town said she's pregnant she's a virgin would you believe that if you believe that you believe anything but that's the gospel mm -hmm. the incarnation the cross the atonement and the resurrection on those three issues stand or fall the christian enterprise amen any one of the three undercut or denied or removed you do not have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now put those three things down. I'll try not to let you forget them tonight. But look at that, Dr. Kirka, another one, because we got to get through those and start this sermon. He's a top-notch man. If I let him live, he will amount to something. It's like Kyle. I'm going to let Kyle live 30 or 40 more years so he'll amount to something. Look at this. Now in the evangelical, it's one thing to say in the unbelieving world. But there's a complete rejection, rejection in large segments of the evangelical and the Catholic Church that the atonement is a vicarious sacrifice of Jesus Christ from sin. Amen. They just deny that. God loves everybody and his love will just save everybody in the world. They're all universalists. Uh, my mentor for some time, I said he was Clark Pennick. He doesn't believe anything anymore. He didn't learn that from me. <laughs> But he'd get all upset if he said he wasn't an evangelical. Now I don't know what that word means. That means anything. That's what nominalism does to you. Words mean whatever you want them to mean. Oh, no, they don't either. Anyway, this, if, you, if you're interested why the preacher's got a very slow Xerox machine, he'll Xerox his schema, but this will tell you the whole dynamic. Uh, in the evangelical world, I'm not talking about the so-called, uh, that's unbelieving enough, but I'm not talking about the unbelieving world. I'm talking about the so-called Bible-believing world. They don't believe any of the things that are essential for the salvation in Christ. The blood of Christ does not justify us because they deny the penal, the legal element of justification talk. And that goes into penology, it goes into the courts, it goes into the... And that's why this man, he killed three kids and he killed his grandma. Well, we got to give him a government subsidy. Minimum security in, in our prisons costs $20,000 a year. But we certainly don't want to kill them. Oh, 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 we're civilized folk. But we kill a million and a half babies every year in legal abortion. But they're nominalists and they're not really alive, are they? Okay. But see, I don't believe that. You might. But you legalize killing a million and a half babies legally. I don't know how many is killed. But those are legal. And that means primarily taxpayer. I can't stand any more entitlement. I don't need any more giveaway program and then ta tell me the taxes have to be increased to pay all these bills. Really? I can't possibly. I said, forget it. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going on Apollo 13 and I'm out of here right away. <laughs> 
to look at that. It's very serious. It's much more serious. It'd be better to hear just pleasant things and affirm what the Bible says, but very few people in or out of the church believe that. Now that's, I can't go into all, all that tonight, but uh, look at uh, the, the message tonight that I do want to say a word about is Jesus is under fire. We're justified by his blood. Now the essence of that is the cross. Now, the cross was a completely negative symbol in the Greek or Roman world. They killed the riffraff, the scum, the worst criminals of the world. Well, what's he doing on the middle one? He hadn't done anything, had he? They only killed the bad one. They must have thought he was bad. What had he ever said or done that necessitated? See, they had, had three illegal court cases. That sounds like... O.J. Simpkins and $5 million. I would agree that you better not kill him because you'd have an insurrection. Not over justice, because you'd be prejudiced. Yes, I would. The gospel according to Romans and Jesus under fire in our postmodern culture. Now, postmodern culture is not just a palaver of junk talk. It means there is no true truth. It was just mowing the lawn. Is that? <laughs> well, we, I really appreciate that. I only get a tape of it, just, so I just I couldn't just hear it once. <laughs> Postmodern, whatever else it means, the, the preachers and the teachers will tell you that. But that means there is no true truth. And we're into tolerance. We tolerate everybody. That's how you get multiculturalism. Everything is relative. But see, how would you say, uh, make a statement that everything is relative? That happens to be in logic, an apodictic, A-class proposition. What's that? You've made a true statement that you yourself said you couldn't make. Mm -hmm. I didn't say you couldn't make it, though I would say that. You can't even open your mouth and make such a remark. The minute you speak, I gotcha. But postmodernism is not just postmodern, it's a whole mindset. And the church is in that. Yes. Youngsters at schools in that. They're in education from the womb to the tomb, in education that'll transform their lives if they're not informed. And no true truth, and we tolerate everything because there anybody that has the gall to say, Jesus only saves. Now, they don't mind us saying Jesus saves. They do mind anybody saying Jesus only saves. Mm -hmm. That's something that is unacceptable in our culture. Even ask the church members if they think that's not close-minded. Well, it's not fair. Okay. I, I was born and live and die in a world that's unfair. Romans, justified, that's a legal term. The kaosune, the word, is the same Greek word that we get justification and righteousness. Just a tiny, that tiny at nine o'clock at night is not a time to discuss grammar. I understand that. I'm going to do it anyway. What are you doing? Two different, seemingly completely different English words with one Greek word. Well, one is objective genitive. Yes, it is. What on earth is that? Well, we're justified, that's from the outside. Righteousness is the consequences on the inside. On the inside. So there's no such thing as just objective data. Amen. We can know the truth and go to hell from the church or from the pulpit or from an elders meeting, just as they say. But dikaosune means we've been justified and we're righteous because he said so. Yeah. because he is atoned for me because I couldn't atone myself right. and if he wouldn't have atoned there would have been no possibility so it isn't it is the problem there's repeated statements in the Bible but Luke says in Acts 4 12 in no other name that's what's offensive yeah. in the postmodern world there is no other name whereby men must be saved Amen. that means they can't be saved otherwise 
So that's the foundation of evangelism and mission. Get on with this message that our brother brought me 900 miles to speak. This boy's got to leave already. He's got to play or something. He's going to play hockey tomorrow. He's leaving town. Now watch him because he may steal somebody's car. Have you got any new Lexuses or Infinities out there that I need? <laughs> I saw a lot of junk cars out there, but I, I'm interested only in, in Lexuses and uh, Infinities. That's a poor man's uh, Rolls Royce. See. No other name, Jesus under fire, justified by his blood. Now that's a cross. And justification is a legal term. That means the holiness of God demands atonement and the love of God provides it. Amen. Amen. But the one that demanded it is the one that provided it. Amen. See, that's why the incarnation is absolutely essential to the Christian word. Crucifixion? Why well, they crucified thousands of hulums? What so particularly? He transformed that negative image and transformed it into something magnificent because there's where God invaded this universe to speak to the very heart of the human situation and be the only source of recovery from its fractured condition. Amen. And he rose from the dead. Now, other people in the Bible have risen from the dead. But they died again. They said, now don't close up their tombs because they'll be back. Mm -hmm. But he's the only one they can't find. I said, all you have to do to refute the Christian faith is find him. That's right. We'll put Mayo's. You know where Mayo's is. And if Mayo's can't find it, you haven't got it. <laughs> They've got $100,000 computer readout for every system in the human body. And in 10 seconds, they say, well, you got about an hour and a half to live. Most of, have you got any, any more positive news? Well, you might not have an hour and a half. <laughs> well, I'm going to get another opinion on that. <laughs> okay, get another opinion. You've got less than an hour. Okay, that's three opinions. Okay. <laughs> the heart of Romans, the heart of Romans, is the power of God. Let me give you this and then tell you how God has used Romans, and then I'll talk a little while. In Romans 1, 1 through 17, we have a statement in the structure of Romans of the gospel, what it is. Gospel is not just the diarrhea of the mouth. The gospel is God's word to the human situation. In the second section of Romans is the wrath of God. That's rather negative. Don't get as serious as sermons on that because you'd have feminist marchers or Left-handed lesbians marching out on oh, the wrath of God. That's completely negative. Against all humanity. All locked in that. The third element, now notice wrath, because without the wrath, the third element don't make much sense. Mm -hmm. The grace of God was made available by the gospel. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now God cannot tolerate sin, but he come to get us. Amen. That's grace. Grace is not a blue-eyed blonde. Grace is the holy God that's broken-hearted when you haven't got time for God. you got 30 minutes for church and eight hours to watch a ball game. God knows that, and you better watch it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Another section in the Roman epistle, 5 through 625, 5, 1, is God's peoples united in Christ. We live in a pluralistic age have you ever tried to unify? we got brothers here divided over various things. Do you ever try to unify some group of people? If you get three people together, you got four opinions. <laughs> They've got an extra one. <laughs> Not necessarily. We'd have to put that on the computer. But you ever try to solve anything by computer or, or by a committee? See, you never solve when I could do quadratic equations. I never solved them by committee. He said, how do you feel about this? Get a health report on it? Or a biology test? And said, how are you feeling about this? That's not how you solve problems, real problems. You have to know about it or there's no resolution of it. Amen. But merely knowing about it doesn't mean that you can resolve it. But without knowing about it, you will not resolve it at all. 
Amen. Great, notice all these great words and pray up and get to the message. I've got one. The next section is 7, 1 through 25, is the God's law and Christian discipleship. Now the hot button word is mentoring. That's just a Latin euphemism for the same Greek word we get disciple. A mentor is one who trains one. So why do we go to, now that's a big thing, we're majoring in mentoring. But Jesus is majoring it long before anybody used the Latin word. Amen. Disciple. What that amata taste is a witnessing learner. He's not just a witness there. He's got a witness about something. Or she, so it's not chauvinistic, pardon me, for gender privation there. The next section in Romans 8, 1 through 39, is the Spirit of God. Well, we live in a pantheistic world. So the spirits are ever placed. So how are we going to talk seriously to the post-generation, Generation X people, about the Spirit of God when they got spirits all over? Half of the world are animus. What's that mean? They got spirits in everything. In rhubarb and rattlesnakes. In, in trees. Everything's alive with God. That happens to be Hegelian pantheism, but they don't know that. They think that's advanced learning. I said it's so advanced, it's minimally uh, 2,000 years old. Of course, Greek pantheists did the same thing. Other than that, it's marvelous. Thank you. Then, hello? Now, God is, is getting to us, I think. The next section, uh, 9 to 11, if you're only saved in Jesus, what about Israel? you got three chapters in Romans, mm -hmm. and because, thank you for mentioning baptism, because that's not a politically correct thing to say, because that offends some people, but notice Romans 6 is right in the midst of the affirmation about the gospel. Yeah. It's not an accident of where it is. Mm -hmm. No redactor put it in there. It's right in the midst of a central section in Romans. And then, if you're saved only by Jesus, what about the Jews? No, what about the Muslims? What about everybody else? Isn't everybody saved? Well, that's what evangelicals are saying all over. Everybody's saved. Oh, that isn't what the Bible said. How do you make that seeker-friendly? Well, you can't. Because you can't market Jesus. You can't make him acceptable to cultural ears Amen. by watering him down to be acceptable to you. He is the one that issues the word. We do not enter a word to him. He sends a word to us. Amen. He's God. Now don't forget this. The last section, 12 through the conclusion, is the will of God and then the providence of God. Well, providence has been out since the scientific revolution. And the will of God has been removed to the will of men. You know, all that. Right. The whole structure of Romans is a direct attack on the postmodern culture. Now these things, what has God done with Romans? And then we've got to have some points in, in the sermon where you're going to pieces probably. But hurry up and go if you're going there. I want you not to forget in 386, a 33-year-old pagan named what comes to be called Augustine was reading in the 13th chapter of Romans. And he became a Christian. And I told that fool to stay out of Romans, but he changed Western civilization for 1,000 years by reading the Roman epistle and believing it and communicating it to the O's around about him. Augustine, like it or not, he's one of the world changers. Most people can't even change their mind. Once in a while, there's some unique person, but the uniqueness was not in this pagan. The uniqueness was the pagan that came to the cross and he upped the tomb and he found the power of God. He played musical beds. He had fatigue from playing musical beds. If you don't know what that is, just forget about that. A second time, in 1517, at 27, all these kids, 27-year-old monk was reading the Roman epistle. I told him to stay out of Romans. 
The Roman Catholic Church was destitute. It was morally corrupt to the core. Martin Luther was a Catholic priest. He didn't start the Lutheran Church. The Lutheran Church did that. He wanted to morally transform the Catholic Church. Because from the priesthood to the pew is corrupt. And the fool was reading Romans and created what is now called the Reformation. For 400 years, Europe was politically and socially structured by the borders produced by the preaching of the gospel according to Romans. It was a direct confrontation with the possibility of the Roman Catholic Church. He wasn't playing games and said, oh, we're going to have that speaker back next year because it was so much fun and we get the singers back and, and he'll put the people to sleep again. They didn't know who they had hold of when they got old Martin. 27-year-old kid. He had a doctorate in theology. Now, most doctorates in theology, if they knew anything, they never said it in public. <laughs> and here, this would be an encouragement. You need encouragement. He was 15th in his class of 57. Well, that means you don't get any jobs. <laughs> okay. But Martin's the one. I have a list of them, but you don't even know who was first in his class or second or third. He was 15th. He changed the world. Of course, he was reading Romans. Hadn't the Catholic Church ever read Romans? Well, not recently. He changed the world. As a matter of fact, the gospel according to Romans. He put... Huh. Right. Job, yeah, yeah. Light or no light? You pass out among them. Hello, hello. And then, 200 years after the Reformation, have you ever heard of England? You heard of it? Oh, John and Charles Wesley? There's two other fools. I told those babies to stay out of Romans. No, dumb as most British here are, he's in the Roman epistle. What did he do? Why, John and Charles Wesley wrote and preached a commentary on the Roman epistle that saved England from a fate worse than the French Revolution. It changed the whole social fiber of England for a hundred years. That's pretty good, isn't it? Amen. The last revival. Well, Billy Graham's a nice man, but he's not going to do anything. And any lesser person is going to do less than nothing. But Wesley changed the world. He took children out of the, the mines. He took women, mistreated women, out of the factories. He changed the social fiber of the world. That's what a revival is. A revival is not a nice meeting. You come back tomorrow night to hear what dummy has to say again. This is the gospel according to Romans because it cuts a heart out of human belligerence and arrogance and says that God is in command of this place. Amen. I was going to bring you, I didn't bring it in. It's in, in a bag. Run out and get it. I have a golf ball. I have a message from uh, Psalm 8. Why don't you get to Romans 5, 19? He said, I mean, he said what is man that's art mindful of? Uh, do you have any idea how large the earth's galaxy is and how large the universe is and God, he cares for me. Just for high school talk, I bring a golf ball out and a dot on a golf ball would not represent the size. It would take 100,000 light years to get out of the earth's galaxy. And God, it's quite tiny, is what I'm saying. And when he said, what is man that thou art mindful of? All you need to do is at least get B minus in contemporary microscopic physics and see how vast this world is and God visited this earth because man alone was created in the image of God, not rattlesnakes and, and bees and gooseberries and all the, the nonsense and pantheism that's going on in all the groups that march in Washington. I say they're out of work if you're marching in Washington. Amen. So if you haven't got anything to do, just march in Washington. Good. Well, look at that. Just a dot on a golf ball would be the size of the Earth in, in just the Earth's galaxy, and that's a little tiny in the cosmos. Get a shot of that. Get, get a science projection here and say, what is man that you're mindful of? You have any idea how small this whole thing is? How does such small this get so belligerent? We have no idea how small they are. Oh. Oh. 
get a golf ball and take a just a pen dot and 10,000 light years that's the speed of light this pretty big universe and that's just the earth's galaxy that's not all the thousands of millions of galaxies beyond the earth's galaxy which is quite big what is man that thou art mindful of him and right in the midst of the eighth psalm he has God at the first and God at the end and God is the answer to that question you try to answer it without God there is no answer Amen. so good try well Wesley as a matter of fact changed the England from a faith worse than now all of France theoretically was Catholic how did he get so morally destitute well that meant that you could be a Catholic without being moral but you can't be a Christian without being moral those are different things and then another this is absolutely amazing because uh Bucharest for me, I've been there, and that's Nowheresville. You could take 10 minutes to walk all over town. But in 1916, Cornelius was studying at the Orthodox Theological Seminary in Bucharest, Romania. So what? That's not very much. I told that fool to stay out of Romans. He read <laughs> Romans. He was a priest. Did I tell you that? And transformed his life, and that fool translated the Bible into Romanian and to this day that is the standard Romanian text 1960 just read Romans pretty good isn't it Amen. is that a good sermon mm -hmm. it's like C.S. Lewis more people been one to Jesus by reading the Narnia tales or miracles or any other magnificent works he's a magician from another world reading Romans he was transformed and he translated the Bible in their mother tongue the receptor tongue still to this day is the standard Romanian text now studying Romans to do that we'd get something done to do. now we're not done well I'm done you're done in 1916 a young and almost all bright Germans are belligerent they think they're God's, uh, God's gift uh, to the universe. They're, they're even suspicious of the brilliant uh, genius of the Greeks. They're better than the Greeks. Okay. Karl Barth, 1919, published the Romer Brief. What on earth is that? And who gives a hoot? Well, that's the Roman epistle. And do you know that young, outspoken German preacher wrote a com another commentary on Romans. I've got 104 commentaries on Romans myself. What are you writing another one for? You think you're going to say something else? What he did was attack the whole liberal foundation of Western civilization. What are the four fundamental assumptions of liberalism that dominated Europe, Germany, the United States at that time? One was the inherent goodness of man. Well, that's not acceptable with Romans. No. Amen. Two, the inevitability of progress without any concern about re renewal in the church. Mm -hmm. That science and technology and education is going to fix it all up. As we all know, education costs more, and we get less and less. Mm -hmm. If we just had more money and more teachers and, and more golf games and more basketball games, well, we'd transform, and more night basketball, well, no wonder we don't transform people's lives. Just homeschool. Amen. Well, inevitability of progress, that violates Romans. Inherent goodness of man denies his sin. That the perfectibility of man without reference to the grace of God we're justified by his blood we're not justified by where you go to school or what your GPA is we're justified by his blood the cross and the total reality of nature what that simply means is there's no creation those four assumptions of liberalism and the Roman epistle slashes at all four of them. No wonder they heard Bart. They heard Romans again for the first time. 
because it attacked the whole foundation of society. And he transformed the world just quickly. Those that, I'm not enamored with Karl Barth, he, he's just a genius, but every genius is not something, someone that I enamor. No, he's, he's a good man, but he's been replaced. Now, the same thing, following Bart's Romer brief, uh, we come into closer to our world. We come into the period of, uh, of two Germans. Martin Niemela was a Nazi U-boat captain in the Second World War. He'd sunk more Allied ships than any other German commander. Big man. And one day, I told him to stay out of Romans too. Did I tell you he was a preacher? Yeah. He was reading Romans and he became convinced that he couldn't do that anymore. He asked for an audience with Adolf Hitler, that crazy man. Now, Adolf Hitler respected Martin Niemela because of what he'd done for the Vaterland, the Drei Reich. But Hitler put Martin Niemöller under house arrest. <coughs> Here's what he said about me, this preacher. I can't kill people anymore because I heard the gospel according to Roman. And Hitler said, he must not be allowed to be guarded by the same man twice because he's too dangerous a witness to allow him to witness to the Amen. same man two times. Is that power or is that power? And another cohort that comes from Romans, during the, that war's end war, we haven't had war since the Second World War, have we? <laughs> that war, another German, and he was the only German preacher. Imagine, the home of the Reformation, and they're going kaput. The only German preacher in bombed out Berlin the only church building that hadn't been bombed. They only had to advertise this. Seven o'clock, Helmut Tilke. Everybody that read the paper knew Helmut Tilke was going to preach. And it was full every night, risking being bombed that night. He preached other things, but he preached from Romans. Oh, it's powerful. It's transformed nations, persons, institutions, social structures, institutions of learning. God, do it again. We're justified by his cross. We don't need a pharmacological analysis of blood. It's a cross, and the cross is offensive. But that's where God answers our problems. Amen. Amen. My favorite, yeah, my favorite mission story is Peace Child. Missionary found it very difficult to communicate Christ in a non-Western culture. Went on and on. Despair was coming. We're not very effective. And they noticed something one day that they hadn't noticed before. Warring tribes, you know, like Africa now, only the beast child. The missionary noticed that there could be peace between these warring tribes if the chief of the tribe would present his newborn son. The chief had a son and gave that son to the other tribe and there was peace till that son died. But the son that God gave is peace forever because he lives forever. Amen. Heart of the Christian enterprise, the incarnation. A 
atonement and the resurrection. Without those three underpinning foundations, we have no gospel of anything. And these are the foundation notes of the church. Two simple stories, and then we just pack up a load and go home. Or go wherever we have to go. The Bible says that the cross and the person of Jesus is the foundation of any resolution of the human situation. I'm not equating what I'm about to say with the cross. But are you aware that the Empire State Building has 40 floors of foundation underneath it for 112 stories above it? It has a foundation that you can't even see, but the people who build it know it's there. Got to have 40 floors to hold it. Yeah. Without a foundation, there's no building. Amen. And then... In another day, before electronic surveillance equipment was widespread, a boat was traveling and it was a storm. And the captain could see a light in the distance. He said to the radio operator, when they had radio operator, my brother was the radio operator on the Albert T. Harris when the Indianapolis was sunk. And no message got through. That's why it was sunk. But the captain told the radio operator, send a message. Turn 40 degrees starboard. Nothing. Nothing. Kept getting closer and closer and closer. The light was brighter and brighter and brighter. Sent the message again. It says, turn 40 degrees starboard immediately. And the word came back and said, you turn, we're the lighthouse. Amen. You turn, we're the lighthouse. God created the church to be the lighthouse. A call to tell people on a journey to turn. Let's pray, sing. God, how we thank you for these brothers and sisters. We thank you most of all for Jesus. Yes. We thank you that you created the church, but you created it by your death and by a voice out of an empty tomb. God, how we praise your name because you've demonstrated that sin and death have been overcome. Those are our problems and you've solved them. And we love you for it. Amen. We respond to you because we can respond to no one else. There is no one else. There's no more holiness. There's no more love. There's no hiding place. How we praise your name, God. We thank you for the gospel according to Romans. And we thank you that we've been justified by his blood because we could not and cannot justify ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.